Chapter 3. Analysis of the Types of Aspiration for Enlightenment, or the Meanings of Jnana. All bodhisattvas aspire to the enlightenment, or bodhi, realized by all the Buddhas, disciplining themselves to this end and advancing toward it. Briefly, three types of aspiration for enlightenment can be distinguished. The first is the aspiration for enlightenment through the perfection of faith. The second is the aspiration for enlightenment through understanding and through deeds. The third is the aspiration for enlightenment through insight. The Aspiration for Enlightenment Through the Perfection of Faith Question. By whom and through what kind of discipline can faith be perfected so that the aspiration for enlightenment may be developed? Answer. Among those who belong to the group of the undetermined, there are some who, by virtue of their excellent capacity for goodness, developed through permeation, believe in the law of retribution of karma, and observe the ten precepts. They loathe the suffering of samsara, and wish to seek the supreme enlightenment. Having been able to meet the Buddhas, they serve them, honor them, and practice the faith. Their faith will be perfected after ten thousand eons. Their aspiration for enlightenment will be developed either through the instruction of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, or because of their great compassion toward their suffering fellow beings, or from their desire to preserve the good teaching from extinction. Those who are thus able to develop their aspiration through the perfection of faith will enter the group of the determined and will never retrogress. They are called the ones who are united with the correct cause for enlightenment, and who abide among those who belong to the Tathagata family. There are, however, people among those who belong to the group of the undetermined whose capacity for goodness is slight, and whose defilements, having accumulated from the far distant past, are deep-rooted. Though they may also meet the Buddhas and honor them, they will develop the potentiality merely to be born as human beings, as dwellers in heaven, or as followers of the Hinayana. Even if they should seek after the Mahayana, they would sometimes progress and sometimes regress because of the inconsistent nature of their capacity. And also there are some who honor the Buddhas and who, before ten thousand eons have passed, will develop an aspiration because of some favorable circumstances. These circumstances may be the viewing of the Buddha's corporeal forms, the honoring of monks, the receiving of instructions from the followers of the Hinayana, or the imitation of others' aspiration. But these types of aspiration are all inconsistent, for if the people who hold them meet with unfavorable circumstances, they will relapse and fall back into the stage of attainment of the followers of the Hinayana. Now, in developing the aspiration for enlightenment, through the perfection of faith, what kind of mind is to be cultivated? Briefly speaking, three kinds can be discussed. The first is the mind characterized by straightforwardness, for it correctly meditates on the principle of suchness. The second is the mind of profundity, for there is no limit to its joyful accumulation of all kinds of goodness. The third is the mind filled with great compassion, for it wishes to uproot the sufferings of all sentient beings. Question. Earlier, it has been explained that the world of reality is one, and that the essence of the Buddhas has no duality. Why is it that people do not meditate of their own accord on suchness alone, but must learn to practice good deeds? Answer. Just as a precious gem is bright and pure in its essence, but is marred by impurities, so is a human being. Even if a person meditates on his precious nature, unless he polishes it in various ways by expedient means, he will never be able to purify it. The principle of suchness in human beings is absolutely pure in its essential nature, but it is filled with immeasurable impurity of defilements. 
even if a person meditates on suchness, unless he makes an effort to be permeated by it in various ways, by applying expedient means, he certainly cannot become pure. Since the state of impurity is limitless, pervading throughout all states of being, it is necessary to counteract and purify it by means of the practice of all kinds of good deeds. If a person does so, he will naturally return to the principle of suchness. As to the expedient means, there are, in short, four kinds. The first is the fundamental means to be practiced. That is to say, a person is to meditate on the fact that all things in their essential nature are unborn, divorcing himself from deluded views so that he does not abide in samsara. At the same time, he is to meditate on the fact that all things are the products of the union of the primary and coordinating causes, and that the effect of karma will never be lost. Accordingly, he is to cultivate great compassion, practice meritorious deeds, and accept and transform sentient beings equally without abiding in nirvana, for he is to conform himself to the functions of the essential nature of reality, or dharmata, which knows no fixation. The second is the means of stopping evils. The practice of developing a sense of shame and repentance can stop all evils and prevent them from growing, for one is to conform oneself to the faultlessness of the essential nature of reality. The third is the means of increasing the capacity for goodness that has already been developed. That is to say, a person should diligently honor and pay homage to the three treasures, and should praise, rejoice in, and beseech the Buddhas. Because of the sincerity of his love and respect for the three treasures, his faith will be strengthened, and he will be able to seek the unsurpassed enlightenment. Furthermore, being protected by the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, he will be able to wipe out the hindrances of evil karma. His capacity for goodness will not retrogress because he will be conforming himself to the essential nature of reality, which is free from hindrances produced by stupidity. The fourth is the means of the great vow of universal salvation. This is to take a vow that one will liberate all sentient beings, down to the last one, no matter how long it may take to cause them to attain perfect nirvana, for one will be conforming oneself to the essential nature of reality, which is characterized by the absence of discontinuity. The essential nature of reality is all-embracing and pervades all sentient beings. It is everywhere the same and one without duality. It does not distinguish this from that, because it is, in the final analysis, in the state of quiescence. When a bodhisattva develops this aspiration for enlightenment through faith, he will be able, to a certain extent, to realize the Dharmakaya. Because of this realization of the Dharmakaya, and because he is led by the force of the vow that he made to liberate all sentient beings, he is able to present eight types of manifestation of himself for the benefit of all sentient beings. These are the descent from the Tushita heaven, the entrance into a human womb, the stay in the womb, the birth, the renunciation, the attainment of enlightenment, the turning the wheel of the dharma, or doctrine, and the entrance into nirvana. However, such a bodhisattva cannot be said to have perfectly realized the dharmakaya, for he has not yet completely destroyed the outflowing evil karma that has been accumulated from his numberless existences in the past. He must suffer some slight misery deriving from the state of his birth. However, this is due not to his being fettered by karma, but to his freely made decision to carry out the great vow of universal salvation in order to understand the suffering of others. It is said in a sutra that there are some bodhisattvas of this kind who may regress and fall into evil states of existence, but this does not refer to a real regression. 
It says this merely in order to frighten and stir the heroism of the newly initiated bodhisattvas who have not yet joined the group of the determined and who may be indolent. Furthermore, as soon as this aspiration has been aroused in the bodhisattvas, they leave cowardice far behind them and are not afraid even of falling into the stage of the followers of the Hinayana. Even though they hear that they must suffer extreme hardship for innumerable eons before they may attain nirvana, they do not feel any fear, for they believe and know that from the beginning all things are of themselves in nirvana.